Hello, I am so glad to be here. I'm Dr. Arielle Schwartz, and I am here with Dr. Lisa Morton and Tracy Levecki. And um, I am so grateful to be here with the two of them today to talk about your new book, their new book. Um, this is called Healing Hearts and Minds, A Holistic Approach to Coping Well with Congenital Heart Disease. And um, so this is an opportunity to really share with um, a broader community about this book and why you wrote it. And so I want to just start by asking you both the question, knowing that you have backgrounds in mental health and psychology, what brought you to you know, focus your work on congenital heart conditions and to write this book? Well, um, I, I guess I'll begin. So I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I also am somebody who was born with a congenital heart condition. And throughout my life, I noticed this enormous gap in terms of the way I was um, cared for. You know, my physicians were very much um, survival focused and there wasn't really anything being done to address the emotional and the psychological piece in terms of my treatment. And so um, after a few experiences feeling frustrated, why isn't anyone asking me about this? I said, we need to do something about it. Great, great, thank you. I'm yeah, sure and just to, to kind of follow up from that, um, like Tracy, I'm a, a first generation um, survivor of somebody born with a heart condition. So back in the 1940s, only sort of 20% of us survived, but over 95% of babies born with a heart condition will now survive. Um, so congenital heart conditions affect about 12 million people globally. Um, but we now know that around about 50% of adults with a congenital heart condition will experience anxiety or depression. And Tracy and I both felt that that was understandable given the kind of rocky life journey um, that we've both faced. Um, so I'm a counselling psychologist and researcher in Scotland and, and Tracy's over in the States. And we got together through our joint advocacy work and decided to write the book that we'd both been looking for, but have been unable to find. Yeah, beautiful. I, that, that is such a key piece. We wrote the book that we have been unable to find. For people that aren't familiar with CHC, can you just share a little bit more? Um, what is that? And, and um, I know you've named some of the statistics of the numbers, but just share a little bit more. Sure. Yeah, congenital heart disease or conditions are the most common birth defect worldwide. Um, Lisa had mentioned the 12 million people worldwide. There are about 2.4 individuals in the U.S. And out of the adult population with a CHC, um, it's estimated that only about 10% are in appropriate care. So that's something that we want to really get the message out for individuals. Um, the other thing that I think is confusing for some people is that CHCs are very different than coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease is something that is progressive and develops over time. And it's usually linked to age or cholesterol or diet and exercise. Um, CHCs, on the other hand, are um, abnormalities that are, are basically formed in utero. There's structural differences in the heart. And um, oftentimes they're diagnosed in, um, in utero, sometimes at birth. And there are some individuals that are diagnosed as adults. That's less common though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing that really struck me in reading the book was how many medical interventions are required to treat CHC. You know, I know, um, Dr. Lisa, you were one of the youngest and kind of a case study in the sense of being 11 days old when you had your mm -hmm. first um, open heart surgery, essentially, if I'm getting that correct. And, and, you know, when we were speaking about how many repeated surgeries, and I'm, I'm guessing, um, Tracy, that you have a similar story, um, you know, and, and kind of knowing that your stories are embedded inside of the book, that, you know, how many repeated surgeries and how much, um, as you said, Tracy, like how much focus was just on keeping you alive, but not really attending to the psychological, emotional sense of 
um, safety or processing those kinds of events, or even at a time when, you know, it was assumed that perhaps babies wouldn't remember these events. And now we know so much more about even pre-verbal memory and, and the impact of those kinds of traumas. So that's one of the things that really touched me um, about reading this. Tell, tell our listeners more about your book. Um, well, I mean, what you've said is, is, is accurate. And I guess it's important to, to note, and Tracy and I have been very kind of clear about this in the book, that everyone's story is very unique. Um, and it does encompass CHC any heart condition from birth. So for some people, there may be only one surgery or kind of one intervention. For others, like Tracy and myself, um, we've kind of been in and out of hospital our entire life. And it also depends on the generation. So because we're kind of from the first generation of survivors, a lot of our, our kind of procedures have been experimental. Um, so like you say, I was the first baby in the world to be fitted with a pacemaker back in 1978. Things have moved on a lot since then. Um, and in terms of medical, but also in terms of our understanding, like you say, about trauma, attachment, the importance of that early bond, pain, um, psychological safety. So we know so much more now. So we are in many ways hoping to work with the com medical community to take what we know in psychology and our research um, and embed that within medical care, because that's something that we felt a gap in. So within the book, we draw from the most evidence-based psychological theories and um, research to develop in what we hope to be a very accessible way to take that knowledge, um, but to give that to people in a very accessible way. So they have the tools and the techniques um, that they kind of can use to manage what truly is um, a long-term condition that's cradle to grave and kind of validating a normal response to unusually adverse life events. Um, so we're both very keen on, um, well, you know, sometimes people will be maybe diagnosed with mental health difficulties, but um, what we would, would like to do is get in there earlier before that happens and be able to meet that psychological need and acknowledge um, that, you know, it's not normal to have a big operation when you're younger, um, when you're a baby. And also having a lifelong health condition impacts on your relationships, your finances, your life choices, your childhood experience, um, your parents' mental health your relationship with your siblings. So, you know, when you kind of look at that in terms of risk factors and protective factors for mental health, then you're creating quite a vulnerable position. And um, so we hope to, um, yeah, draw awareness of that, provide those tools and techniques. But we also want our book to act almost as an advocate in itself, because this is a story that hasn't really been told. Um, and Tracy and I do talk about how this is almost a public health crisis. Tracy already mentioned the lack of a specialist care for adults, um, and, and that can be a big problem as well. One thing that really strikes me um, about both of you is that in the process of bringing your stories out there and writing this book, both for the sake of advocacy and education and and helping normalize that, that if you if you are someone that has grown up with early medical intervention, whether it's CHC or other conditions, um, that it's very common to have additional mental health um, experiences of anxiety or depression or post-traumatic stress that you might not even link all of that together. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you've really just connected the dots for your readers. But one of the other thing that strikes me about both of you is that this also is your, your kind of what I would call post-traumatic growth. Like this is an outcome of your own commitment to your own healing journey and now having a way to give back. And I just um, was wondering if either of you wanted to speak to that side of this. Well, I love the way you just put it. Um, I hadn't considered that before. And this is a story um, that has been within me for years. I mean, almost 30 years. And I remember starting my outline when my my 20 year old was first born and, you know, and then Lisa and I came together with our outlines and they were pretty much identical. So um, it is it is, um, you know, I think it's been healing and I think it, it helps me to feel um you know, good that we are getting our stories out there, that we are empowering people, that we are letting people know that they're not alone, that others have been there before them. And it's, you know, and, and that there is hope. 
there is hope out there. So um, I'm hoping that those messages are communicated to whoever needs them. Yes, that's why I wanted to do this this uh, video, this interview with the two of you. Is that's my hope too? Is that we really get the word out there for more and more people? Because I think it's very evident, at least it is to me, um, that what you have put together in this book, while it's directed towards individuals with con congenital heart disease or conditions, it's also really applicable to other chronic illnesses. And could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, we, we absolutely um, hope that, as you know, um, I have an interest more generally in medical trauma. Um, and I think we, we'd kind of, we met through, the, through that interest and, and that joint interest. So yes, we absolutely, I would say, I don't know if you agree, Tracy, but about 80, 85% of the book could be applicable to any long-term condition, and particularly a childhood um, condition. And that was something we considered with our editors, Oxford University Press, if we should write something more generic. But we felt like because our community had nothing out there, we wanted to do that. And because we can speak to that specific experience. Um, but I think that, that yeah, generalizations can definitely be drawn from that. Um, and I always kind of say that I think there, there's a lot of focus at the moment on adverse childhood experiences. But for me, medical trauma is being um, omitted from that agenda. And that's something I'm very passionate about um, trying to raise awareness of and, and kind of have more consideration for the psychological impact of childhood illness and um, lifelong. I've, I, I've already um, received feedback from some individuals, someone had type one diabetes, they said the book was super helpful for them. Um, somebody commented about cystic fibrosis and cancer. So I am getting that type of feedback. And I do agree 85% is mm -hmm. relevant. And I think it could be relevant for just being a human being. Because we talk about, you know, the emotional stuff, everybody has low mood, everybody feels anxious sometimes. And then we talk about what to do about it. So um, I completely agree. It me too. And, and, and to me, you know, part of how, um, you know, Dr. Lisa and I met was through the polyvagal community and through this, you know, for me, so much of that connection between heart and brain or heart and mind is that connection with the vagus nerve and, and how that gets impacted um, uh, or sometimes even damaged in the, um, those kinds of surgeries, but also how it's the link to healing. And I love that you included the polyvagal perspectives um, within the book about, you know, can recognizing your own nervous system state, recognizing cues of threat as they show up in the body, but also, and this might be one of my kind of favorite um, contributions here is also recognizing what facilitates psychological safety and how we receive those cues back from the body that let us know when we feel safe, mm -hmm. how cultivate more of that, because that is very much what provides then the foundation for, you know, more healing and feeling in a way safe enough to finally unwind the trauma mm -hmm. um, within those safe contexts, uh, other people, therapy, and so forth. Um, I might just shift gears for, for just a moment before we close today to speak about um, the measure of psychological safety. And um, I'll share with our viewers here that there's the neuroce neuroception of psychological safety measure that um, Dr. Lisa and colleagues put together that um, they have graciously allowed me to include in the Applied Polyvagal Theory and Yoga book that's going to be coming out in January. January of 2024. And um, I just would love to hear a little bit more, and again, both of you can chime in on this, about um, your pers perspective on that um, tracking of psychological safety. Um, I guess, yeah, this has been embedded throughout the book as well. Um, and I was drawn to Stephen Porgy's work because of my own experiences, my personal experience of having a cardiac condition from birth and thinking about what that does to your autonomic nervous system um, and also spending a lot of time in hospital and how that impacts and feelings of psychological safety. So that's led me to work with Steve over the last four or five years. Um, and that led to 
me leading the development of, of that specific measure because I feel like while we have a lot of measures of pathology within trauma, we don't really have a measure of um, how do we know when people are improving um, or how do we know when we've made a change to a situation that enables people to feel psychologically safer. So, for example, within the therapeutic relationship, one of the main tasks is to make um, to enable our clients to feel psychologically safe, but we have no way to, to measure that progress. So while it was initially the, the idea for it actually did come from feeling safe in a medical environment um, to try to mitigate the, the risk there to try to prevent PTSD, it has grown and we've had international um, yeah, kind of, I've had emails from all over the world for people using it within the therapeutic relationship in terms of um, people using it with people with PTSD or, or childhood sexual abuse or all lots of contexts. So um, I should say I developed that with my colleague, Dr. Nicola Cogan and some of our students um, in collaboration with Stephen Porges and Yaket Kolax from the, they were at the University of Indiana and, and we developed it at Strathclyde University. So um, it's an exciting development and um, it has psychometric validity. There is a paper that you can read about it and we have a handbook um, and we've just completed a second study. So we're looking at the data there, but it's looking really strong in terms of the validity of the measure. So it's, it's exciting Beautiful. to see that it and have feels, it. It feels so user-friendly to me. And I know that the two of you recently met with um, a medical team at Mount Sinai Hospital in New mm -hmm. York. And are you finding that the medical community is, is receptive to integrating these tools and even this measure in the world? <laughs> Um, you know, so far we were we were so happy with the reception we got at Mount Sinai, and we're really hopeful that that will spread. Um, you know, I, I think in due time it will hopefully. Um, I think Lisa's been getting a little bit more attention in the UK, um, but um, you know, the book just came out. Um, you know, in January and Lisa's scale recently, so it takes time I think for these things to happen. That's right. And we we have in, in a lot of ways an uphill battle in that medical uh, field arena to, to really emphasize that psychological safety. It's something that I think in so many systems in our world, we get the message to just keep pushing past, to keep, you know, focus on the goal rather than the process. And so um, I just want to say thank you both of to both of you for joining me today, for giving your time. And, um, and, you know, to bringing this book out into the world, I just want to get the message out there um, uh, about how valuable this is. And, um, and we'll keep, keep spreading that word. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for having us.